2019 annual YLT SIG web conference. And opening day three of our web conference is Fiona Mocklin, who is a teacher trainer, materials writer, and teacher who specializes in secondary, young adults, and graded readers. Her publications include ETpedia vocabulary, published by Pavilion, how to write secondary materials, published by ELT Teacher to Writer, and the courses Dive In from Delta Publishing, Motivate and All Clear from Macmillan Education. She is also co-editor of the IATEFL TD SIG eBulletin and co-founder of EVE, Equal Voices in ELT. She has a keen interest in photography, art, creative writing, and psychology, and this spreads to her work. She's now based in Oxford after 28 years in Spain. Take it away, Fiona. Hello. <clears throat> can you hear me? I hope you can hear me. Just if you can. Yeah, great. Um, well, it, as David said, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you. I'm going to be opening today's sessions talking about um, neuroscience, really. It's about the brain. Um, it's largely based on very recent um, research. As I live in Oxford, I have access to some of the public lectures here. Um, so I'm combining uh, sort of research and information that is more generally available, and I'll give you some references in just a second, uh, with even more recent research which has not yet been published. Um, I'm going to try and go through the theory sort of bit by bit, but in a fairly compact kind of way, because I'd like you to try some activities. I'm going to be a bit experimental as this is a webinar. Um, and we're going to try and do some activities which obviously will be slightly different because you're presumably sitting in a room by yourself right now not, and not able to work in pairs and stuff. Um, but at the end, there'll be a few minutes for questions and answers. So if I have gone through the technical part or the theoretical part a bit too quickly, do feel free to ask. And as we're going, you can type questions in, um, which I'll then look at at the end, OK? Um, I said I would, oops, hold on, I'm using the wrong arrow. I said that I would give you a reference. Um, Sarah Jane Blakemore is like the researcher in this area. She's also incredibly easy to read, to listen to. She's just, oh, she's just wonderful. So if you're interested in this whole area, uh, she's the person to, to check out. Um, she does a lot of stuff about the social brain because that is the main part of the brain that's developing in teenagers. Uh, the, you know, the physical, the mechanical, the basic skills are in primary, um, but secondary or a secondary age is uh, a cognitive level is sort of in three age groups. There's the early stage, sort of from 12 to about 15. There's a middle stage that's about 15 to 17, 18, which is the one I'm focusing on mostly today. And then there's a later stage that's sort of from 17-ish up. Um, these ages are, they're dis they've discovered recently, they're kind of cultural variables involved because um, depending on the culture that you live in, the amount of sort of protection or even overprotection from your parents, et cetera, your cognitive development is likely to develop, to develop slightly more slowly. Um, slightly influenced by screen usage as well, but not to kind of a panic degree. Uh, that affects uh, development of things like empathy, how many real faces and people and uh, situations you're in compared to things that are negotiated via screen. So when I give these ages, they are uh, largely based on sort of Western Europe, Europe, Western Europe, uh, North America kind of age groups. So adapt to your culture as necessary. Um, but anyway, Sarah Jane Blakemore is the person to check up on the kind of the big picture. I'm going to be talking about specific parts of the brain today, uh, the memory forming part, the part that that sort of is in uh, maximum development stage at upper secondary. So if you want a bigger picture, definitely check out her. That book is available on Amazon. There's also a, a Kindle version, which tends to be cheaper and easier to, to get to access. The Royal Institution video is about 45 minutes long, uh, really good. It's more recent than the TED Talk. Um, but of course, the TED Talk's only about 
14, 15 minutes. So if you want a little taster, that's the one to go for. And they're both readily uh, available on YouTube. So am I going too fast? I hope not. <laughs> I'm just very aware of the time. Um, the four parts of the brain that I'm going to mention today are these, the caudate nucleus, the amygdala, of which there are two, the left and the right, surprise, surprise, uh, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex. Um, how should we look at this? Um, these parts of the brain are responsible for memory. Uh, so I'm going to go back a slide. Those three parts there, the caudate nucleus, the amygdala, and the hippocampus, they work together to create um, long-term memory and episodic memory. There are three kinds of memory from teaching. Um, from a teacher's point of view, you need to activate all three. We have the declarative, which is uh, the knowledge one. Um, you know, what's the capital of Holland or Netherlands? What's the capital of Burkina Faso? You know, these things. That's declarative, knowledge. Um, we have the procedural, which is the memory of how to do things how to write. You know, when you're little and you pick up the chubby pencil and it's hard to write, but now when you pick up a pen or a pencil, you don't have to you know, really think about the stages. It's automatic because it's firmly implanted in your procedural memory. And then the, um, the episodic memory, which is you know, nostalgia, when you remember what happened yesterday or you go back in time um, and you remember experiences. And those things come together to form our memories. So as teachers, if we can activate all three of those, we will form really complete memories when we're teaching, our, when we're teaching language. Um, we do tend to focus more on the declarative and the procedural in the language classroom, unfortunately. Um, so if we, today, you know, most of the ideas that I'm going to show you, we're working a little bit more with the episodic, or they'll bring in the episodic so the memory is is clear, it's stronger, it's the three sides of the triangle rather than just two with the third one open. Um, anyway, those three parts of the brain are in the centre of the brain and they uh, work together to form long-term memory. Then the prefrontal cortex, no great surprises here, is up here at the front um, and that is responsible for these things. Now, uh, as you can tell, they are very important for becoming an adult and for learning and all these things. Concentration. Concentration is largely based on our senses. Um, if you think about it, you know, we need to be uh, looking at something, listening to something. When we're concentrating, we're not in a state of floatiness. Uh, mindfulness is, is effectively the opposite and yet at the same time the same as concentration, uh, but we're concentrating on you know, external things, sounds or smells or whatever, the, the moment. But concentration is about the senses, as is, in fact, attention, which is also relevant, not to the prefrontal cortex, sorry. Um, it's also relevant for planning, for the capacity to plan, to sit down and plan, just plan your day or plan a strategy. Um, that's why, for example, you know, when you're younger, you need more help with planning your future. You know, when you're at school, thinking about where ultimately you need to go, then you go to uh, a careers advisor or somebody to give you more advice on that. Whereas as an adult, we have a, a, a better developed capacity for planning. Uh, same with judgment. It's largely to do with experience as well. There's a connection there, but our brain has stored more information based on our experiences, so our capacity for judgment. That all comes from prefrontal cortex. Um, the capacity to express what we're feeling, not to feel, but to, to explain to somebody what we're feeling or recognize exactly what it is that we're feeling and communicate that. Um, part of our community, uh, creativity is also in the prefrontal cortex. Um, our grammar is embedded. Our, our capacity for grammar and to sort of uh, the real, the real sort of abstractness of grammar is in our prefrontal cortex. Um, and also the capacity to moderate impulses and inhibitions um, to stop yourself from slapping that idiot on the bus. You know, <laughs> uh, you know those reactions, the, the things that you you just you don't bash into the back of the car in front because they're cutting in front. You you swear or whatever, but you 
you know, you, you have the adult capacity to stop that reaction. Um, however, of course, the big problem with it from the, the secondary teacher's point of view is that it's not yet developed in adolescents. They are in a stage of development whereby, um, if you imagine a cauliflower, and I've done this using a showing a cut cauliflower before, if you imagine a cauliflower cut in half, it looks much like the inside of a brain, slightly funny shape and funny colour, you know what I mean? Um, and so you have, the, the if it's like this, you have the, the, the stem bit, well in your brain that's the thalamus, at the back of the brain you've got the cere cerebellum, with the mechanical part, you know, the motor skills are at the back, and then we've got the thalamus, it's also development of motor skills. Um, here, my fist would be um, the, the limbic system, which is effectively in the centre of your brain, and around here, imagine the kind of the other grey matter is around my hand. But this fist, in this fist, we've got um, the caudate nucleus is kind of at the bottom in the middle here. The two amygdala are either side there, left and right. Um, and the hippocampus is over the top. Prefrontal cortex is up here somewhere. And our brain develops, loosely speaking and generally speaking, from bottom back to upper front. So that's what, you know, the motor skills develop first and it, the development progresses that way. That is a generalization, but loosely speaking, it is that. Therefore, it's no surprise that, you know, in, in the maximum moment of uh, adolescence, around about 15, it's the social brain, the limbic system that is really buzzing, really fizzing. And the frontal, prefrontal cortex is just starting to work. It's not really there yet. We have all these parts of the brain at all times, but we're not using them yet. It's like muscles. It, it, every, the brain is like a muscle, you know. Um, you develop them slowly. We, we develop, you know, babies develop the physical muscles first and the brain muscle effectively second uh, and develops in that order. And we need to practice each part, using each part to develop it. Just like if you want to develop your muscles in your arms, you have to you know, you can't do it in a day. You have to, over a period of time, do some weightlifting, do some press-ups. Same kind of principle with the brain. Um, now, if we know that, and we do know this, go back to Sarah J. Playmore and all her uh, MRI scans and stuff, we now know that, you know, the, the adolescent brain, around about the ages 15 to 17, that is when your brain is at its biggest. It's at its biggest, but also messiest and buzziest, and everything is happening all at once, and it's all, you've all been 15, haven't you? Do you remember that time where just everything was going on in your head at once? If you look back on it, you know, oh, all this stuff was happening. So that is the area that we really need to work with if we're teaching upper secondary. We can help train that part of the brain and then to lead to the development of the prefrontal cortex. We can support all these things on the screen at the moment. We can help support the concentration. We can help support planning. We need to help support planning. We can't just say go off and do a project. We have to help support the planning. Um, David mentioned, you know, I wrote Dive In recently. That has a lot, it's very clearly planning projects all the way through it. Uh, we can help support judgment, we you know, help them support their arguments when they're doing debates or essays or something. But they need support for all this part. But also, you see, grammar is in this section. So if this is the least developed part of the brain up to the age of, well, you know, after 17, um, it's the slowest, it's the most inefficient part of the brain as well. So. Basing your teaching at that age group on grammar teaching is just frustrating for you, for them. It's slow. They don't make uh, any quick progress. So it's really not the way to go. We're going to have a look at which way are the way to go. All right. Before we move on, though, talking about adolescents here. Now, if you've got your little chat box there, what do you think the answer to that question is? At what age does adolescents end right choose one of those and start typing which one which age do we go for 
19, it depends. 27, 23, gosh, we're getting all the answers, aren't we? 23, depends on the country. 19, gosh, we've got pretty much a spread here. Um, never, exactly. Yeah, in some people, that is true with some people. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually provably true, particularly with some politicians that I won't mention right now. But it is. Um, now, I'll tell you, this is one of those things that the uh, the researchers are still out, you know, the, the jury's still out on this. It isn't 19. It's definitely later than 19. Um, the, the sort of the theoretical, um, if an adolescent is in like an average situation not one where they have to start working when they're 14 or something if they're just kind of going through the motions going through life it's somewhere around 25 to 27. that is roughly when the prefrontal cortex is fully developed which is um, effectively the definition of the end of adolescence it's when your prefrontal cortex is fully developed because then you will have um to say adult capabilities or capacity um, round about 30, people are now saying round about 30 as well, in certain uh, cultures, because in Western Europe and North America nowadays, a lot of people don't leave home till they're about 30, and therefore they're not taking those decisions that, um, for example, my generation had to take. I'd leave home at 18, you know, so uh, planning finances and all that. So it is kind of other at the moment. Um, for more information on that, watch the uh, Sarah Jane Blakemore video, the one at the Royal Institution. Uh, she goes into more detail about it. So it is kind of other because it's all those ages, depending on where you are and depending on your culture, depending on your life experience. Uh, we, you know, the First World War. You know, kids were going off to war at fourteen, telling a lot, you know, lying. Is it? So obviously, we're confronted by a very different situation. It is not fixed. It's very much dependent on the age but on the whole if you're teaching middle class ish kids in a private language school then it's going to be 25 27 uh university may well be that as well because they're still protected by the system um depending on your situation it could be younger all right so it is it's fuzzy but if you put round about 23 to 27 as the average you're safe that also means that the majority of your students are likely to be adolescents they're likely to be upper secondary in inverted commas um, at least at the cognitive level okay moving on <clears throat> tick we've talked about the prefrontal cortex now we're going to move on to the other three bits and we're not going to talk about the prefrontal cortex anymore just because it's effectively older than upper secondary um, i'm going to bring us back to the age group that is um really sort of in the developing the social uh, brain stage so approximately 15 to 17. Um, now this is possibly slightly controversial uh, the words will be however the science isn't and i'm not quite sure in a way around it but anyway um there is a gender difference between cognitive development now when i say gender i mean biological uh, chromosomes in the brain <clears throat> okay so is, or should we say gender at social level is variable but uh, in the brain effectively cognitively there's a tendency to male and a tendency to female um, the tendency to female brain develops on average about two years before the tendency to male okay uh, you can make an endless number of jokes about that that guys take two years longer or whatever however um, it does have there's an interesting sort of spin on this and this is something worth bearing in mind if you teach teenagers quite frequently um because girls social brain uh, develops on average about two years uh, younger than boys and a large part of the language capacity is in there um words language and expression are in the amygdala right uh, the the prefrontal cortex development will kick in a little bit earlier in girls so that means grammar will kick in a bit earlier in girls um, this leads us to this urban myth that girls are better at languages than boys 
and there are teachers out there in schools and education so entire education systems that say oh yeah girls for languages you know boys for science and maths or whatever there's um there's a kickback against the sciences are for boys but there should be a kickback against the languages are for girls thing because boys capacity for languages it just develops a bit later and gentlemen out there um it lasts longer so ultimately uh, men can be better at languages than women they or potentially if they fully develop or if they take languages to their full potential the male brain ultimately has a better capacity for languages um the problem with it is it kicks in a wee bit late and so from secondary school point of view you know some sometimes maybe give up on the boys or the boys give up on themselves well don't let them because um around about age of 17 is when they really start to woof win the language so don't let them drop out of languages before that all right so that's one of those over myths and it's up to us to break that myth and get the boys doing languages just just in the same way that we've been getting the girls to do the sciences okay um now an activity now i've done this before with teachers i've done this with students i'm going to try and do it with you the only thing is normally i do this with groups so i'm going to have to modify it and i've made notes i might have to look at my notes for this one if you don't mind because i had to think this one through earlier this will involve you doing some typing now have a look at these funky animals <clears throat> can you see them clearly give me a quick type can you see those pictures clearly yeah cool can you see the colors clearly can you see that for example the top middle is red and the bottom right is orange because sometimes on screens the colors adapt yeah cool right um now normally in classes i would put my students in small groups pairs threes no bigger than that and ask them just not what the names of the animals are because that's like that's encyclopedic but to guess which countries they are from each of those seven animals is from a different country with you just for time reasons and typing reasons i'm going to ask you you can imagine you've got a friend sitting next to you if you like but choose three of those no googling please choose three and then in that little textbook type the color for example dark blue and the country that you think they're from all right just the color and the country for three of them so for example you might go i don't know pink japan all right ready steady go three of them please we've got pink australia yellow madagascar don't go australia keep going Red Indonesia, lilac, amazing country, blue Bangladesh. Uh, do that again. Go back again. This is much quicker with a clicker. Never mind. Indonesia. Okay, I'm still clicking on the screen here. Boom. Right. I hope you can see that I'm actually moving the slides. Okay. Stop. Thank you. Brilliant. We've got some. Lots of ideas there. Tanzania, Malaysia, Africa. Ah! <laughs> or in Argentina. <laughs> Helen, you're saying, ah, I wonder what happened. <laughs> right, what I'm doing here is with these seven animals, if I give seven animals like this to teenagers, you're all adults, I assume. Hand up if you're a teenager, but you're mostly adults and you're towards being an adult if you're around about 25 26 okay um yeah africa is not a country by the way it is it's an entire continent anyway um if i just say look at the pictures guess the country there are and i wrote this down somewhere i think it's 145 countries in the world that is a huge number of possibilities that is like getting one of those menus with pages and being asked to choose just one dish and you just look at it and you go huh and you just want somebody else to choose for you so with teenagers what i do is a cheat screen which is this with the answers or if i'm in a classroom if i'm in a normal classroom i write my cheat thing on a big piece of a4 and sort of flash it up flash it down so that they've got the images but you are 
allowing a cheat option for those who want it. In my experience, some students don't want it and won't look. But other students will look because by allowing them to cheat, you eliminate that vulnerability, or not eliminate it, but reduce the vulnerability, and also by reducing the choices. So for me, it's a little bit like the restaurant thing. It's that huge long menu compared to the little set menu with three starters, three main courses, and a dessert, that kind of thing. It is psychologically or cognitively more comfortable to cope with a set menu than a page, one of those book things. You'll know what I mean, I'm sure. All right. So this is also a way to deal with a matching exercise. I do this with a lot of matching exercises in my course books. I scan or photocopy the pictures, and I just write a big, you know, a big piece of A4 and felt pen. Um, not A4, A3, sorry. Um, matching exercises in course books, you will have the picture, you will have the vocabulary, and you will have match the pictures with the words. Now, there is very little cognitive effort involved in drawing a pencil line between a word and a picture. Plus, if you get it wrong, it doesn't matter because the teacher will tell you in the end anyway. OK? There is very little learning happens with that kind of um, activity. However, the course book does provide us with useful pictures um, and obviously the vocabulary. We can create this kind of thing, and this kind of thing will be far more effective. They are the country. The countries in this case, I chose these for, for you. I mean, because I was fairly sure you might not know all of them. You might know some of them, probably not all of them. I also chose them because some of them are, um, I taught in Spain for 28 years. If you've taught in Spanish speaking countries or probably Italian or um, many of those countries, they will tend to say like Australia and Madagascar and Ecuador, Argentina, China. I want them to repeat, repeat, repeat effectively in English, the English pronunciation as well. So I've chosen those uh, countries. And then if they're saying Australia, I'm, going, I'm correcting Australia. I think it's Australia. Oh, I don't know if it's Australia. Oh, yeah, you might be right with Madagascar there. Now, I noticed somebody was right with Madagascar. So, you ready to see the answers? No answers. Ah, shall I show you the answers? Yay! Okay, these are the answers. The blue one is from Thailand. Dark blue is Thailand. Red is Ecuador, Madagascar, China, USA, Australia, Argentina. I can tell you the names of the animals if you're really fascinated. However, that is not the vocabulary that I would be teaching my students here. All right. <laughs> but I do love the name of the red thing. The red thing is called a red-lipped batfish. And I really think that's one of the best names of a creature on this planet. OK? Apart from the What's that thing in the middle called? A star-nosed mole. There in a lot of course books. Anyway, so that is um, one way of dealing with a matching exercise. Now, also with something like this, I would then go on to do another stage just to check, because I know about the brain, and I know that problem solving um, really does reinforce. I'm going to come back to this slide uh, a couple of times later on, so do try to remember it. Um, I would then go on to ask students, for example, to look at those countries and think if the zero meridian uh, runs through London, which of those countries is furthest west before you get to the date line and which is the furthest east? I might even get them to put them in order, though that's difficult to do because there's a bit of overlap. But which of those countries do you think is furthest west? And the type, and no Googling. Huh? Anybody know? Without Googling it, who said Ecuador? Two people said Ecuador. Well, I can tell you because I checked it myself yesterday. Ecuador is approximately level with New York, New Jersey. The west coast of Ecuador is approximately level with um, New Jersey, some of that kind of side of things. So the USA, because it extends all the way over, most of the USA is west of Ecuador because of the angle and the Americas there. Sorry, that would be the other way from your view. <laughs> okay. And east, 
East is fairly easy. I'll have to tell you East in a moment. Yeah, East is Australia. I had my doubts about um, which was further east, China or uh, Thailand, because of course China actually comes quite far west. But it is an interesting one with students who get them to put the seven in order and get them in sort of east, west, but in order of proximity or, you know, which one's the furthest, which one reaches the furthest uh, west, and which ones are the nearest to the east or something like that. Um, and that will give further processing of the words and also the problem solving. OK, yeah, give them a bit of extra knowledge as well if you're doing CLIL. And I had quite a lot of fun looking it up myself. OK, I'm going to move on. If I can, hang on, let me ping my arrow. There we go. Right. So that activity was looking at um, that tilt business, definitely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, this, that activity was looking at um, various aspects of the uh, amygdala and hippocampus as well, but I'll come to them. But for now, um, I'm going to refer to the aspects of the caudate nucleus that that worked with. Um, obviously, we were trying to trigger the memory here to memorize the countries. I want to say, apart from teaching the uh, countries, I want to teach the pronunciation of the countries there. So I introduced a problem solving element. I got them to guess, basically, um, and then giving them the cheat sheet that entered a kind of a conflict element, trying to match up the words with the images. Um, I tried to avoid triggering the, the decision overload thing. It says, you know, the chordate nucleus triggers worry. Um, anxiety can be caused by excessive decision taking. Any of you who've had anxiety issues at any time in the past um, will know that when you have too many things to, to think about, that's when you have an anxiety attack. And I speak from personal experience here, OK? Um, Code switching, we're going to look at in a minute. Reward and beauty, the reward definitely, you know, we're triggering reward. You get that yes moment when you got one of them right. The person who wrote uh, pale blue, somebody wrote pale blue Madagascar, I think, you know, they went yes when they saw it. That yes thing will stick it, you know, that glues it to the brain, you know, and it's like, yeah, I remember this one. Um, beauty, images, color, make it pretty, you know, good pictures. They were. I don't know if they were beautiful pictures, but they were certainly eye-catching pictures. I mean, that big-lipped, no, the red-lipped uh, batfish, you know, that picture will stick with you, OK? The other thing about training the chordate nucleus, though, is that um, scientists have discovered, you know, using these MRI scans, that uh, people with bigger, better-developed chordate nucleus have better verbal performance, OK? So if you train, then you will be providing them with the tool for better verbal expression. All right? So it is really worth doing this kind of thing. And really just um, bearing in mind, you know, when, these things, when this talk gets recorded, you know, when it's available, have it come back to these slides or screen capture them, screenshot them now, you know. Um, and just remember, OK, if I work on that and I work on that and I work on that, I'm going to really help these teenagers. OK? Um, so I'm clicking on the next slide. Yeah, there we go. Here's another thing to do. Oh, I'm going to go back one moment. I've, I've, uh, I've gone too quick. Quick. I'm going to give you a little dictation. Have you got a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil nearby or a phone? Oh, I'd be surprised if you haven't got one of those. Could you write down these words? Don't write them in the box here. I mean, you can if you want, but better on a bit of paper or on your phone. They're very simple words, but I would be dictating these to a sort of a B2 level class. B2, maybe C1. But if my teenagers are likely to be high B1, B2, all right? Um, the words are blunt, cake, dark or darken, move, or moving, bitter, and sharp. All right, I'll say them again very quickly. Blunt, cake, darken. Oh, I forgot clap. Clap, the verb. Move or moving, sharp and bitter. All right, 
before I go back to the next screen, just have a, a thought for a moment. Look at those words and think in another language that you speak. All right, so it might be in English or in whatever your best second language is. Um, how would you translate those words? And yes, out of context for now. How would you translate, you know, blunt, sharp? How would you, you know, what do you think of when you, cake? How would you translate cake? All right. Just have a think about it. You ready? Have you thought? Had your thinking time? Right. Now, the next screen, I've got some sentences. And again, this um, activity works in monolingual classes, but also multilingual. In multilingual classes, the students kind of explain to each other how they would say it in their language, they sort of translate it to their language and then back word for word into English to explain, to compare. So it's like a comparative linguistics thing. You give them sentences like this. This is, I say, B2. I do this with actually teenagers kind of, I don't know, they're more, I think it's the lack of the impulse thing because the impulse thing hasn't clicked in. Um, Round about a high B1, they'll go for this stuff because they don't have that, mm, this is too difficult, I can't do it thing. If you manage to tap into their, you know, yes, you can do it, they're, they're more likely to kind of believe that they can do this challenge. So you have a look at sentences like this. We've got, he was very blunt. Can't have your cake and eat it. Never darken my door again. It was an incredible clap of thunder. It was a very moving story. And then phrases like sharp left, or it's bitterly cold, or something smells off. I didn't think, ask you to think about the off one there. Um, so you ask them to look at those and um, decide if, they, if it's the same, the equivalent word in their other language that, in, that would be used in that exact same expression. So for example, can you say, can you have your, or you can't have your cake and eat it? in your second language? Is it the same uh, words or is it word for word translation to say that or to give that meaning? I'm getting tongue tied. Am I making myself clear here? Yeah. For example, bitterly cold is a good one. You know, if you're a Spanish speaker, is it actually amargamente frío? No, it's not. You know? All right. So this sort of activity uh, with this, this is metaphorical language. Blunt, blunt is from the sense of touch, effectively. As is sharp. You know, sharp is is something is connected to your sense of touch. Uh, cake is connect, connected to your sense of cake. When you say cake, depending on your, should we say, personal preference for take, cake, for um, cake, a flavour will be triggered in your mind. Um, darken uh, the, the sort of the visual, the sight sense will be triggered when you say the word darken. Clap is sound. Um, moving, uh, that's the sixth sense. There is a sixth sense. It's the perception of movement in space. Um, nothing to do with Bruce Willis and all that. Um, the movement, perception of movement is, the, neurologically speaking, the sixth sense. Um, so that's another one. And bitter is taste, sharp, you know, feel, smells off. Smells off, it doesn't literally smell off. When you use uh, metaphorical language, the sense centers in your brain are triggered. So when you use the word cake, your taste, your sense of taste is actually triggered. And again, this is coming from um, was University of Lancaster, actually, uh, Professor Francesca Citron. There's a lot of Italians in this area. So if you're Italian, you can be proud of this stuff. Um, your taste sense is triggered when you use the word cake. Your sight sense is triggered when you use darken. Your sound sense center is triggered when you use the word clap. And of course, these words also trigger memory, All right? So these senses trigger memory. So if you teach this language, it will be memorable. Plus, if you teach it by some kind of translating or comparative thing, it will really reinforce it because it comes back to, hang on a minute, let me go back. Oops. Um, it really triggers that code switching thing. And also, the, they have discovered the, from MRI scans that your caudate nucleus is constantly working between the two languages, constantly, constantly. So if you speak two languages, um, you're always thinking in both of them. 
that your chordate nucleus is efficient, so it selects the right word for the right situation. Okay, um, so that's another reason for training your students' chordate nucleus using a bit of translation, not excessively, but some of it, and ideally things like met metaphorical or uh, register. You know, um, do you think you could possibly sit over there, please? You know, would you translate that word for word? That kind of situational stuff where they have to access the episodic memory or the experiential um, moments to work out what the correct translation would be. All that stuff reinforces the chordate nucleus. Okay. Um, here's another one. Some of you might know this person. Um, pictures. When I look at pictures, um, I mentioned before, triggering the chordate nucleus with images triggers the beauty center. Um, also reward. Uh, if you use photos of your students or trainees of your trainer, uh, that triggers that kind of, oh, that's me thing and makes it more memorable. This is one of my colleagues. I'm using one a picture from the back, obviously, because, you know, to recognize, uh, shouldn't really be able to recognize people without their permission. Um, <clears throat> but I use pictures of my students and my trainees when we've been out. For example, if we go out on an excursion or something, I'll take photos and I'll use them in the classroom. They don't necessarily know I've taken the photos, but I warn them at the beginning of the course that I might, okay? Um, I get students to look at the pictures, and then this is a vocabulary thing. Um, I don't want to take much more about, let me see, I've got, we'll do it, we'll do it. We'll do it very quickly, but I want to show you more activities. Um, instead of getting students to look at the picture and I say, uh, where is she? She is in the street, or uh, what is she doing? She is looking at, no, I don't want you to do that. I do want you to think about what, when, where, why, and who, as I would with my students. I would get them to look at the pictures and in working groups and ask other groups um, of what question, which might be what's she wearing or what's she doing or what's she looking at or what's she thinking about. It could be anything. You can choose one question and they ask other groups and then we get as many answers as possible and we use all those answers to build a story or build a description. However, there's another way of doing it, and it's the way I'm going to do it with you. Um, you give them the questions and you brainstorm single word answers. So it's a way of brainstorming vocabulary. And this is easier to do. This is the version that's easier via webinar, as far as I can, I think, I hope. Famous last word. Um, I'm going to ask you to look at those pictures and choose one of these what questions and type single word answers into that box. I'm going to give you an example first and then, all right. The example would be um, to ask you to answer the question, who is she, but not using any um, proper nouns. So you could say, you know, who is she? And they would write down tourist, spy, soldier, police officer, uh, friend, um, oh, body, you know, <laughs> any of these things. So we, elicit single words. The one I'd like you to do is I'd like you to choose either what is she doing, what is she wearing, what is she carrying, or what is she looking at. All right, so you're choosing any of the what questions with doing, wearing, carrying, or looking at. All right, choose one of those and start typing some answers. Single word, just vocabulary. So choose what she doing, or what she wearing, or what she carrying, or what she looking at, and just type single word answers to any of those questions. Maybe husband <laughs> spying. Okay. Right. okay, we're getting loads of vocab. Lunch. <laughs> Trainers. Trainers that were nearly sneakers, weren't they? Yeah. Photos, etc. So we're getting a load of vocabulary. So I can elicit all this vocabulary. And I'm as I'm teaching, I'm going, okay, hiding, husband's fine. No, 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 the kids are giving the vocab to me. We write the vocab on the board, and then the students match the single words to the question. They match all their classmates' words to the question. So for example, spying is the answer to. What's she doing, I imagine? Sunglasses is probably the answer to what's she wearing, not what, but it could be what she's carrying. 
Um, what's she looking at? Husband is probably the answer to husband, etc. All right, so I've given them four very basic questions. I've elicited vocabulary, and then we can have a matching kind of comprehension double check. Then we can use um, the vocabulary. We can then add to this by saying, now I want you to think in groups about what can she see, what can she hear, what can she taste, what can she feel, and what can she smell. Do a similar thing. You know, what can she smell? Well, she's done in my some kind of pet shop there. So what can she smell? Bird seed. What can she smell? Just do you type me one word in there? What can she smell? What do you think? Any ideas? What can she smell? Bread. I like that. Uh, Marelle, I think it must be your speaker because we checked the sound before. Oh. Chickens, rain. Exactly. You see, we're getting a load of vocabulary just from what can she smell. We can't actually smell what she smells. We imagine it. And our brain is going in there and it's going into the senses and thinking, what can she smell? OK, and you do a load of stuff, something fishy. Yes, probably. I like that. Um, so you can draw out masses and masses of vocabulary from this, you know, from the two photos or from one of them. Then you can use all that vocabulary for a description or a story. Um, and what you've done there is you've triggered all this stuff. You know, you've got reward, beauty, we've done the code switching. Um, but we're also switching into the amygdala here. Uh, the amygdala, there are two of them. Surprise, surprise, the right and the left. You need to trigger both because the right um, amygdala is responsible for expression. And the left amygdala is responsible for language, basic language, not grammar, just like vocabulary, lexis. Um, so you need to trigger both. The only thing is that um, the right amygdala is automatically triggered when you speak a foreign language anyway, because the right amygdala is also the center of things like anxiety and fear and embarrassment and negative emotions. And um, Abu Talebi, whose name you will get on the last slide, uh, did brain scans and there are images available of these brain scans. And it's clear that when you are speaking a second language, particularly one that you're just at the beginning level of, the lower level of, and if you're a teenager, of course, with all your social stuff kicking in, but your um, inhibitions and sort of control center not fully developed yet, the right amygdala is always triggered anyway when you're speaking a, right, uh, a foreign language. So as teachers, because with the right one's triggered, we need to focus on the left one. The left one is um, the area that uh, pleasure, you know, the, the emotions of pleasure and joy and engagement and interest and all that is in left. And fear as well, but that positive fear the kind of fear that makes you go on that ride at the at the fun fair. Um, it makes you stand on stage when you've got to read a poem or sing or something. It makes people like me do this kind of stuff, you know. So there's a buzz to it. It's a positive kind of fear. Um, so because of the right one is always triggered, we really do need to work on the engagement side of things just to balance it out to make sure that both the expression and the language are going to happen in the classroom. OK, so something like that photo activity, particularly in groups where they're working together, it's going to be a bit of noise, but they're going to feel that they're actually doing something, achieving something. And then support all that vocabulary will support a written piece. So we're doing that well. Um, we've also clicked into the senses. I'm sorry about the word taste there in the middle. I don't know where that's come from. Anyway, um, we've triggered the senses and the senses are what trigger the amygdala. OK, so as you can see at the bottom there. The amygdala is the thing that's responsible for attention via the senses. Uh, if I snap my fingers, that's a sound and it draws your attention. If I wave my hands, that's movement that draws your attention. OK, uh, we need the reward and engagement stimulus. Um, students, uh, teenagers are not fantastic. They're just learning social interaction. They're just learning face to face interaction. If you teach primary kids, you know, they're not so great at, um, at working in pairs, for example. Uh, with teenagers, work on that, work at the face-to-face, -face. work at the small groups. Milling, not yet. There's going to be too many kids in the class that they don't like or are bullying them or whatever, so don't do too many millings. But the pair work there, um, that's why I do all this pair activity, you know, the get them working in pairs as forming the questions, get them working in pairs or small groups, brainstorming the vocab. Okay, that's all amygdala stuff. Um, Right, this is where I've got about five minutes, six minutes, and then we'll do some questions. I'm going to do a couple of activities with you, and then I'll give you the references. All right, you ready for a couple more activities? Uh, let me see. I forgot what I'm going to do with you, though. 
Um, okay, yeah. We're going to do sight of images, hearing music, you know, use background music for descriptions or whatever. Um, I've written a lot of this. Um, check out ETpedia vocabularies, ideas in there. Um, we're going to do a feeling movement thing. Now, this is an improv activity. You're going to have to do it alone. Normally, you would do this in pairs. Um, normally, you would do it with whole hands like this. We're going to do it with fingers, because then I can show you on the camera. I'd like you to imagine you've got your best friend sitting in front of you. And you're going to pass your best thing, friend things from, from a box on your lap. So you imagine you've got like a shoe box on your lap. And you're going to let your hands dictate to your brains. Because that's what happens. So if I pass you something like this, and I go, here you are, here's a carrot. And the position of my hand will send a message to my brain saying what it is. OK, it's a carrot. Here's uh, an orange. Here's uh, a, t a tissue. It's a, it's a screwed up tissue. It is clean. Here's, I write, and I'm writing down with my right hand, carrot, uh, tissue, orange. Here's a fish. Here's a sock, etc. So I'd like you just for a minute, imagine you are passing with your, if you're right handed, pass with your left and type with your right so that you pass it. Oh, cherries, cherries. Oh, fish, fish. All right. Move your fingers around to make different shapes. Let your fingers trigger your brain and pass things to the screen or to us or whatever and type the words. Have a go. I'm hoping it'll work. It works very well in a classroom. I'm not sure about webinar, but give it a go. Just hold something. Oh, light bulb. I've got a dice. Or a die, singular, isn't it? Flower, I like a carrot and a flower, cherry. I've got a duster, issue a phone, yeah. Yeah, he has his glasses, yeah. You do it this way. Is it a recorder or a flute? Two hands, yeah. All right, it works well, it's a great warmer. Then you get them to sit down. They have to do this standing up and sort of bending down is better. Then you can have small elephants and all sorts of stuff. Um, and then <clears throat> in pairs, they have to remember and go back and um, make a list of all the things that they took out. So you're going back and then you're going, OK, we've done it here, written form, but this would be spoken. And then they would sit down and write down a carrot, a flower, a cherry, a fish, a sock, a Kleenex, et cetera. Et cetera. OK, it's just a warmer and then you can get them to use those vo uh, words for another activity if you want. Otherwise, say it's a great warmer, it's a great vocabulary generator. If they don't know the word, they can say it in their own language and then they have to look it up and tell you in English. So if they're looking at, like, for example, my students in Spain might go, ooh, uh, pañuelo, and then they have to look it up, handkerchief. All right? So that's something you can do with a, a quick vocabulary thing with movement. Touch. Um, I want you to close your eyes. Sorry, I'm moving on. I'm going super fast because I want to allow you to, about five minutes for questions. And I've only got a couple of minutes, OK? Um, just close your eyes for a moment. And imagine you have a shell in each hand, very different shells. But imagine that your eyes are closed so that you can't see these shells. You can only feel them. And run your fingers over them like that. And then think of adjectives. What adjectives come to mind if you're imagining these shells? Right? Adjectives just for imagining the shells. How do they feel on the inside? If you run your thumbs on the inside of these shells, how do they feel? Are they cold or are they warm? How do they feel? You've got big, you've got small, you've got, okay. That's something else you can do with shells. So I'm going super fast here. I've actually got some shells. I tried this before. Can you see that? Yeah, I've got this shell. So I got like ridged. I tried it with my eyes shut and it was sort of, ridged and almost sticky and light, etc. Um, this one was rough, bumpy, 
etc. Very different. Feels like a star, sharp, etc. All right, so you can do it with the objects as well. Um, something, you know, taking, if you've got 40 kids, taking 40 shells to class is tricky. But if you've got, you know, I do this, and if you've ever been one of my trainees or in a session, I do this with pebbles. Pebbles work really well. Um, get the students to close their eyes and put a pebble in each hand. And then just describe, you know, right now they're very cold. It must be cold in my hair. You know, you can feel, you can guess, then you get to um, describe how what they think they look like, they discuss the colours, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you can do with the real thing, or you can get them to imagine the thing. That works with smell as well. You can get them to imagine smells. I can say to you, imagine, I want you to imagine a smell, I want you to write down four words. One should be a place, one should be a person, but not a proper noun. Uh, one should be an adjective, and the fourth one can be what you want. Um, imagine the smell of soap. Yeah, if I imagine the smell of soap, I think of my grandfather, I think. All right. Can you imagine the smell of soap? Think of the smell of soap and then think of a person, for example, or a place. No? All right. Well, when I do it, I think of, for me, if I think of soap, I think of my grandparents' bathroom because it all smells strongly of soap. Um, a smell I use with students is a smell of swimming pool because then you get lots of stuff about summer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the smell one works well. My grandmother, yes. Yeah, you see, and there's all sorts of, of sort of atmospheric smells. Um, say soap is quite a good one. A swimming pool works very well. Uh, bread works well, um, spices, coffee, wet grass, uh, rain, there's all kinds of smells. All right, so just try and when they, when you imagine a smell, your smell centers are triggered in your brain, your amygdala are triggered and it's creating stronger memories. All right, now the hippocampus we looked at, it's all the same stuff really. Um, it's about senses, it's about mapping. I'll leave that on the screen in a moment while you're asking me questions. So I'll come back to that and I'm just going to show you the last one. This one you might want to screenshot. Oops, sorry. Um, this is the one Abu Talebi is worth reading. You know, Abu Talebi and, and there's lots of ands and written lots of stuff. A um, lot of research, a lot of MRI scan research, kind of the physical stuff. Uh, Francesca Citron. Her stuff um, is probably going to be published fairly soon. It's not quite published yet, but keep an eye out for her. Sarah Jane Blakemore, as I said before. Um, and then some of my stuff. I mean, obviously, if I talk about it a lot, I write about it, I include it in what I do. So those are the three of my publications that I've included um, more of this. And that is my email. If you want copies of the slides or anything, just drop me a line. Um, I'm going to go back to the previous one, OK? Have you got that one? Have you, got, have you screenshotted it? I'm going to go back and then if you've got any questions, I don't see a question box, but um, David's saying something to me. Yeah. If you have any questions, I'm still here for another two minutes. Yeah? I mean, I can say the hippocampus is mapping. The hippocampus is that um, I know where it is, but not what it says thing but it does imply if you're writing materials or worksheets or anything use it in chunks use it in blocks do remember though that dyslexic people or ADHD or these um, you know not funky colors not funny fonts just a block of information and white space and a block of information and white space will do um, but that will also reinforce the hippocampus the colors that I used around the images I don't use A, B, C, and one, two, three when I put pictures. I use colors now, now since I've studied this stuff, because I know that the colors will fix it better in the hippocampus. My visual memory, my senses, my perception will, you know, they'll remember the colors where, but you can remember where those pictures were now. If you think back to those funky animals, you can picture them on the screen, and you might even remember the country, okay? If there are any questions, and if not, just
just email me. Colorblind children. Yeah, black and white. I have stuff on that. Email me and I'll give you an answer to that one, Margaret. Sorry. Okay. But yeah, colorblind. There's one in 12 boys are colorblind. So yes, it's about one in 200 girls. Uh, genetic, you know, chromosome-wise, boys and girls. All right. Okay. Well, Fiona, thank you so much for that plenary and for opening day three of our web conference. I think you've given all the participants an awful lot to think about. And it's really fascinating, all of the brain research and the way you've unpacked all of that and made it relevant and accessible to an ELT and to a secondary, an upper secondary context and showing the uh, fascinating impact then on practical activities for the classroom and also for materials design. So huge thank you from all of us in the YLT3 committee. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks Thanks for having me. Okay, everyone. We're now going to take I... a five minute break and then we'll be back with the first 30 minute talk of day three. Thank you so much again to Fiona and enjoy the rest of the web conference.